I then went and um, set up the security of the very first online bank, did the very first internet banking transaction back in August 1995. During the security audit side, I audited about 150 of the first 500 online banks, credit unions, stock markets, uh, and then sold out back in 99. I also set up a, a secure website that was written in Perl back in the 90s that was run by ISS, Internet Security Systems. So every single one product that they sold had to go through this secure web order system, or was as they called it. And that was probably the most attacked site on the internet because behind was was what was called the keys to the kingdom. So if you could break into WAS, you had access to the software that generated the keys that ran that product. And so you basically, with a, with a golden key, you could go attack any site on the internet. So that was, uh, we were doing that here on that, on that website. First things first, the application I have is uh, started a few years ago. It's just to do with bridge the card game and I currently have about a 300,000 lines of code in it, there's about 80, 80 models, part of it I have about 27 separate gems, 80 odd thousand lines, we use about 100 external gems, so it's probably about 400,000 lines in total when you add the extra stuff. So I'm not sure that people would consider that large, medium or small, all depends upon your um, perspective. For me this would be relatively small given my background. The lessons I'm going to mention are lessons from me, they may not apply to your project, and also the solutions I'm going to give, these are the solutions I used for my project, and very specifically some of the solutions I would do differently for other projects. Standard computer stuff, don't fix something that's working, I often have people wanting to work on improve code, it's like, no, don't touch it. Properly fix something that is broken. Um, the example, I, I'll, I'll, I'll have an example later to do with the foreign function interface, the FFI code, which was the first outside code that we wrote, just wasn't working, finally we threw it all the way. You'll see some of the code I've got, and you go, oh, there's a gem for that, I, I don't care, see point number one. Point number two, um, I was originally going to continue with more slides, but in the dry run, I realized this is going to be a very, very dry presentation. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to go straight into the application that I have. So remember, this is for scoring bridge. I'm not expecting you to know anything much about bridge, but I'm going to point out several things I'm going to address later. I don't want to uh, go over my 20 or 30 minute timeline. So this is just running locally. I've got two tabs open. In this tab, I'm running on port 3220. That tells me that I'm running version 3.22. And I just happened to have picked up the number 20. Both of these have got the same backend database. This one's running in a development mode. The other one is running in production mode. So this one will be a lot quicker. He says having woken it up than this one. Three different things I'm going to point out here. Early on we added the ability to be able to display the database IDs. So when that is turned on, this extra column gets added. This is very helpful for debug because uh, particularly if a customer is running this remotely, we can immediately go find things in the database. So that was a nice feature that we added early on. I have a, uh, a training mode. So when the training mode is turned on, I will show it on, on this one because it's going to be a little bit quicker. So in training mode, I'm gonna go ahead now and create a new event. One of the things is defaults should always work, so I'm creating a, a new, what's called a Swiss event. I'm going to put 22 teams in there, and I'm just gonna, I have this training mode, which is this yellow bar. So I clicked on the button asking it to fill the missing names, and it's gone ahead and filled all 20 name, 22 teams with player names. I don't have to sit there and type. 
So the addition of this training mode bar, which is configurable, has been very useful for um, people coming up, uh, learning the software. I have this reload jam. If ever you've been working on an external jam and you're working on the code, you have to stop rails, restart rails, and for me that's a 20 second plus process. So we added some code we'll just, which just reloads a jam, and so we don't need to restart rails. I'll show you that code later. <coughs> Active scaffold. So all the models that I have, I have got under active scaffold, I can go click on any of them. And rather than using the tools that we want the users to use, this is for support. If there's a field in the database that we want to go change without going through the, without going, going through the regular code, we can just go ahead and edit it. So if there's a bug in the code that, either in the view or the controller, adding this, lets us very quickly uh, fix problems. So if you haven't figured out, I play bridge. I play it quite seriously. This is, uh, I'm, I'm showing you this, this is from the World Bridge Federation. So this is the 2016 World Championship in Rockloff, Poland. Uh, I went there with this Lindsay we finished first in our event, so we got the first uh, thing that was awarded. So at the World Bridge Federation events, you have these computer screens. That's the trophy that we got. And this is in 2018, we just had the World Championships down in Orlando. I had a different partner this time, I was playing with Kristen. And this time it was uh, second, we qualified for the main final, so there's only eight pairs in the US. Kristen's only been playing bridge for three years, so it's a huge achievement for her. This is what a World Bridge Federation event looks like. Those tables are 24 feet apart. You're not allowed to talk. These are called bidding boxes, so you make all your bids using a bidding box. You're far enough apart that you can't hear or see the cards from other people. There is a screen up there so you cannot see your partner during play, and there is a board underneath to stop you playing footsie with your partner. <laughs> and you laugh, but they, before, they, this did not used to be there, and a pair of uh, Italians, they're referred to as the vegetables because the names are Fucelli and Zucchinelli, were caught <laughs> tapping each other's foot in the world championship. <clears throat> so this is all about lessons learned, so find out if you're gonna be photographed anywhere and make sure you don't wear clothing that, uh, that contrasts with the carpet. <laughs> so this is me at a bridge event in the US, and in the US the tables are 8 foot, sometimes as close as 7 foot 6 apart, so if you are in a wheelchair, see the guy with the beard and the cap, it makes life a little bit harder. The reason I'm showing you this photograph is the, all the results are on an old fashioned dot matrix printer, and they are printed on the wall. Um, I'm going to keep this short, but that guy is a guy called Bob Hammond who is one of the, arguably, would be on the top five of anybody's list of the top players ever to play bridge. He's almost also famous because he owned the company that gave the bonus to Lance Armstrong. So it was Lance Armstrong that sued his company to get the bonus for winning the Tour de France. And he then went back and sued Lance Armstrong when Lance went on the Oprah show. Is that Bill Gates? Just like struck in the left. Yeah. So there's me again. Yeah. And I get I get I get photobombed everywhere. So there's two phases to the bridge. The first is the bidding phase, and that's what they're doing at this table. And the second is what's called the play. So this old guy here, you point the card in the direction that you went. So he won the first trick and he's looking not too happy because he's lost every single other trick. The reason people play bridge is what's called duplicate bridge. So here is what's called a, uh, a tray. And this is what gets passed between the two tables. I know he's playing at a team event and with a team four tables down. So you put the cards after you play back in the slot. They go to the other table with a caddy. 
that play exactly the same cards. So it's not how lucky you are with the cards, it's how well you do with the cards compared to your teammates who have, or your opponents who have the identical cards. That's why, um, that's what Bridge is all about. So, anybody know this guy? Warren Buffett. That's Warren Buffett. And this guy back here who is his teammate who is uh, four tables down, there's the, there's the guy in the wheelchair with the cap and the hat. That's Bill Gates. So, Bill, both of them are very active bridge players. Warren actually hangs out online and he averages at least 10 to 12 hours a week. So that's an hour and a half approximately every single day he plays bridge. You can go online, the site he uses is one called OK Bridge, his handle is Tebow, so you can go there. Several years ago I was on the site and Tebow was wearing his partner and he was just sitting there waiting. So I typed in, go to his table, N1 question mark, which is a shorthand for need one question mark. The other one is need two, where you've got a partner will join. So he said yes, so I sit down and join. A couple of minutes later, somebody else, N1, sat down. And then was playing bridge uh, against Warren Buffett for about uh, 30 minutes. And then my wife called from downstairs, you know, dinner's ready, dinner's on the table. So at which point it's like, oh, sorry, got to go, dinner's on the table. But as we're in the middle of the hand, it's, you, know, you wait until the hand is over, then you go. So by the time I got to the dinner table, it's just like, you're late, where have you been? I've been playing bridge with, Bill, with Warren Buffett. <laughs> yeah, she didn't believe that. <laughs> uh, it costs 10 bucks to play in a session. Bill goes to quite a few of the national tournaments. So you can pay your 10 bucks and play against him. Same with Warren, this is a tournament in Nebraska. The two of them typically go every year. So for $10 I can spend three hours sitting at a table. Uh, I'm fortunate I'm in the same bracket that they are in these days. So um, other people play I think as much as like a million dollars for lunch with, uh, with Warren, but I, I can pay my 10 bucks. Anyway, the reason was to show you that the these are printouts on the wall where people find the results. And if there's enough time afterwards, I've got some more Warren and Bill stories. So the software they had was 200,000 lines of code. It was written in Pascal. It was ported from PL1 back in the late 70s. It went to Pascal in the early 80s because Pascal was the language of the future. There was one program, he was retiring. Actually, it was probably several years beyond retirement age. Originally written for, to run on DOS, it had a poor Windows port. In other words, when DOS had a windowing environment that was not Windows, it ported it to run on that. And that was as far as it went. They, which is the American Contract Bridge League, have got a thousand tournaments a year. They have a hundred approximately tournament directors. So every week there's about 20 tournaments going on. And the, the tournament director has to carry the laptops, the dot matrix printers, all this stuff. They decided they were going to replace it, so like any large organization, they formed a committee, the committee wrote a report, and they came up with three requirements. They decided the new program must run on Windows and Mac, SQL database, and functional spec was quite easy, just do what the current software does. Those two words, this is all about lessons learned. So those two words, this report was written by somebody who was not a programmer. That and Mac probably doubled the cost of the project. So obviously you know the final solution which I use, which is the reason I'm here, but what would you propose? So your questions are what user interface would you use, what language you're going to use, what database are you going to use, and given that it's a non-profit organization, it's better be something that's free. So your language is Choices are really based off of the user interface. Do you have any Java programmers here? In the past. A couple. Any swingers here? <laughs> so, I've never swing. So I'll, I'll claim it. Okay, so just a couple of swingers. So for Java, the user interface is uh, AWT is the older technology, Swing is the more recent, and this was at a time Swing had just overtaken AWT. So if you ever write code in, in, in Java, Remember, it's got to run on Mac and PC. Um, Swing was, was the choice. 
The other choice for the code would be writing in the native software. So Microsoft Word runs on both Mac and PC, and it's allegedly some shares some of the same code base, but it's a, a different user interface, different buttons, different look and feel, different feature set, and two completely different programmers to maintain them. So my issue if I went that route was finding programmers that both could code on Apple and also could code on Windows. So I went with a third solution, and I, I found out afterwards I think I was the only one who came up with a solution, which was I was going to do a web-based solution. I had, uh, I had lots of uh, web background, I said I'd written a, a very large website, it was all in Perl. My question was what language I was going to use, and I was really down to three Perl, at that point was becoming old and obsolete. And the important thing, this is going to be maintained. The other choices were PHP, Python, and Ruby. And it really came down to which was the best user interface, and which looked likely was going to last. This is a cheese break. So you just, I, I brought some cheese just for something. That, and you're like, what on earth has this got to do? Anybody here at PMP? Uh, all right, so we've got no PMPs now. So PMP is a um, project, manage, project manager professional, project management professional. Certification comes from PMI, the organization. So I want you to eat more cheese. So remember, if people eat more cheese. Uh, the reason this is important is when I gave, uh, I did the proposal and went up and had a presentation. It was a room almost this many people. And I knew the various questions that were going to be asked, and one of them I knew was going to be project management. I wasn't worried at all about the, the technical stuff, I, 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 more than that. And so I worked with uh, some full-time PMPs, or sorry, some full-time project managers who are PMPs. You don't need to be a, a programmer to be a PMP. And when the question got asked, I was able to stand up in front of the room and say, there's going to be five phases of, of this project. There's the initiation phase, which is the functional requirements, functional spec, blah, 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 blah. Then you've got the planning phase, blah, 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 blah. Then we have the execution phase. Then we have the management control phase. And then finally, we have the closure. So I was able to stand up and go through all five of those. So if you're a presenter, you never have cheese. <laughs> So if ever you have to stand up and you've, you've got a, an ordered list of things to do, and by the way, each of those then gets broken down. So for those of you who are programmers who are starting out, I'd strongly recommend going to read the science of project management and learn. So back then I knew that the, in phase two there were 30 something different sub-phases in phase three, there were 30, 40, whatever it was. I, I didn't, didn't name them, but I was able to articulate how the project was going to be managed. And I found out afterwards that that was one of the, the key things. So the night before when I was trying to make sure I could rattle off those five and not forget, I had the letters and I just came up with if people eat more cheese. So if you guys eat more cheese, I'll remember more. The E was the hard one, because I initi uh, initiation the planning, but I could never remember what E was. So I had to think it anyway, went to E. So getting your head cut off, your execution. So that was my mnemonic. Communicating with customer, all of us who have customers have to do this. I'm gonna go quite quickly for some of this. Some of this stuff you gotta put in the contract. I fail to put this one in the contract, how to track issues with my customer. My customer is based in Mississippi. They are old, people average have been there for 20 plus years. It's a non-profit, they are not as technology advanced. They had never done a major software project before, and I just could not get them to track issues. I tried just about everything. I started with Write to keep it simple, went to Excel, and I, they had three different project managers on, on their end for the course of the project. In a final asset, you know, how are you tracking this? And it was, it was paper in a manila folder. But I lost it three months ago, and I haven't bothered to put it back in. <laughs> so find Whatever you do, put stuff in the contract. Uh, progress reports. I added this to the contract. It's how, do you, how does the customer know that you're actually doing what you say you do? So a very easy way is 
just the number of lines of code in your project. So we use GitHub, so we have a repository. And this is an interesting lesson for me, because they asked one on the team, uh, just write me a script to show me the number of lines of code we have, but I don't want you to include any data files from the customer that we've checked into that. I don't want you to include these test files, but I want you to include those files that got this name, but not these. And they couldn't do it. And that's when I realized that the, the bait, what I would consider the basics, so people are taught how to program, so they know the, the, the software, but they don't know software engineer, they don't know how to build stuff, how to actually do stuff. So this is very simple, it's the WC tool, and for the newer programmers, you need to make sure you know every single two-letter use, two Unix command how to use it. This I use so often, I have it as, <coughs> I have it as an alias, FDF. So this is the solution, find up minus type F for files, prints all the files recursively from your current directory, grep minus V, grep is a global, if I'm probably going way too slow. It tells you what files to ignore. I had it, I've cut a bunch off, I had about 50 extra things. But I, yeah. So my, my lesson learned here was the basics. SME, SMA, subject matter expert, uh, subject matter aware. There are a couple of others, SMU, subject matter unaware, and SMI, subject matter idiot. <laughs> and you really have to avoid the SMIs. So my issue was, so my issue was this was bridge. It's a, it's a card game, it's a little bit technical when you get into it. Do I hire people who know bridge, who are also programmers and have them work on it? Or do I hire programmers and try and teach them bridge? Um, the, not just how to play bridge, but how to score bridge. And the lesson I learned on this particular one was that I, I, I had a full-time program on it who was not a bridge player. And every month I kept on thinking, okay, next month he's going to be able to contribute. And next month, and finally, I, I, unfortunately, I just had to let him, let him go. The average age of the people that I had working on the project, it was, it was over 60. Mostly I ended up with retired programmers, which had its own set of challenges because I had people who were never used code control. I had people that had only ever developed in Notepad. That was a development tool. They didn't know any modern languages. So I had about 10 to 20 overall for the course of the project. I only had two people, the younger ones, they're in their 30s, who had any um, Ruby background. Two had JavaScript, one had database. Very simply, this is my model, and I actually wrote out an informal model before I wrote a line of code. So the tournament or club has events. Events have sessions, and I go down 11, 11 levels deep to the card that is actually played. The reason I showed you that is that's an ordered cascading list. When people write code, it's important that you write code that is going to be supportable. I don't want the best looking code, I want code that's going to be easy to support. So the first one that we came up to is the order. I showed you that 11 cascading list. All of these are fairly, I hope are fairly obvious, which is to use meaningful, consistent routine names. Every routine needs to be short. I had developers are coming delivering three 500 line um, views with way too many nested loops. Organize, and this isn't obvious when you first start as to how best to organize it, but it, periodically you do need to reorganize it. So I have a, a team section model, and that's uh, a section that is going to run typically a three hour event and it's for a team of four. They're gonna have a set of boards, and they're gonna play a set of matches, and in some number of rounds. The, these are all, unfortunately, interconnected models. So this was the old code in the view, the team section rounds sorted by blah, blah, blah. And we we're running into too many bugs with people not sorting properly, display problems. So finally I said, okay, I'm gonna standardize. It's going to be ordered underscore model name with an S or ES. And so a move to this. 
This is the first standardization of the code. So I'm old fashioned, I have a comment block. So it's very easy in the code to go find it. This also stands out. So I have a, an ordered start, I have an ordered end as well. So I put the ordered code, and it's fairly simple, so I can grab a set of ordered boards. Won't work if there's an update because this is setting variables, but works well otherwise. So now I had a code block, ordered start, ordered end, and I applied that to all the models. So all the models had consistent names. And at this point, the models were getting to be about <clears throat> 500 to 1,000 lines long. So I took it the next step. The, the problem was that people were adding, adding routines. They were using different names. They were adding to the top of the file, bottom of the file. just couldn't track it. So these are just the C's that I had. Mm -hmm. All in all, right now when you create a new model, if you were to create a new model, we have about 300 lines of just blank comments. So all I've done here is just a single line. But by structuring the model so that each the sub-items within the model, it was a lot easier to keep track of the code. And this has worked very well. I wish I had done this at the start. And in fact, I've, I've deleted some things just so they would fit on the screen. So as an example, anything to do with counting within the model goes within there. Anything to do with the training goes within there. And so from model to model, I can easily go find it. As a technical manager, your job is to pre-avoid bugs. When I was working with the uh, Apple operating system, we figured the cost was about tenfold. So if a developer fixed the bug, it was one unit of time. If the test group caught the bug, it increased it by a factor of at least 10, probably closer to 50. That's because of the interaction needed, the test group needed to document it. We now needed to write regression tests. And if it was then delivered to the customer, it was another factor of about five or more because we had to deal with interacting with the customer and make sure it was fully documented back to the developer. Fixing things early before they get out is crucial. As a technical manager, your job is to avoid bugs. Standardizing the code. So for us, anybody written Pascal here? You guys are, oh, okay. So Pascal, the array start at one which is logical, that's where an array should start at. It's, it's the, the first element of the array is zero. So the, with, in copying some code from the old software, that was a problem. And so with the three most common bugs that we run into, the scoping and the off by one errors. All right, I hate Boolean, so I'm gonna explain why. I'm sorry. I, I strongly dislike booleans. I'm not allowed to use the word hey. So here's a statement. A, a boolean is either true or false. I'll let you figure out whether that statement is true or false. I was going to give you a, look, a lengthy story about George Boole, who actually was born 35 miles away from where I was, self-taught mathematician, went to Ireland, became a professor out there, uh, married, Mary Everest. Uh, Mary American pronunciation, like Mary Everest. And she had an uncle who was a professor of Greek. She had another uncle who went out to India and did the geological survey, the great geological survey of India. East India Company asked the, the people how long that survey was going to take. They're going to map out India. They said five years. It took 70. And they had up to 700 people working on it. George Everest was one of the uh, people in charge. He retired <coughs> to England. When he came back, there was uh, um, Hill XV, it was called, or 15, and it didn't have a name, so they, they suggested naming it after him. And he wouldn't have it named after him, but the British Geological Survey insisted. And uh, he said, but the in the native language there, they, they can't pronounce. My name is not pronounceable, so. We now know it is Mount Everest, but the guy was actually George Everest. So that was his uh, uncle George. Paul um, had, uh, his grandson invented the uh, monkey bars. So if you guys have ever played on monkey bars, that's your connection. Anyway, you're pondering rather than asking. The answer is both. 
And it's both because it comes back to, it's a scoping problem. In the context of Boolean logic, it is either true or false. In the context of, of Ruby and electronics, it's actually both. So here is my example of why it's both. Anybody know what numbers will get printed? Two and three. And the problem that we have is that in Ruby, a Boolean has actually got three states. So this is primarily for things that come out of the database. It's either true or false, or it's not been set yet. We had about, we kept the same data types as the previous systems, moved them to a SQL database. We had about 50 Booleans in, in the code. And what was happening was developers were not properly checking for the not set part. And, you know, I said we fix things that are broken. Finally, I, I just had enough. Um, somebody had spent, wasted too much time on yet another Boolean, got rid of them, replaced them with integers either zero or one. Remember the, one of the lead developers said, that that's, that's probably gonna take about a week with all the code to do it. And it's like, it was only about an hour or so's worth of work. And so, what was very interesting was the lack of knowledge of, I call it text processing. So people today, they may know how to program, but they don't know how to text process. In other words, take a large group of files and accurately edit those files. Mm. Code style. Uh, this is what C code looks like. You guys, some, some of you have probably never seen Pascal. So this is real life working Pascal code. This was back when characters were very expensive, so there's no comments. And this code is saying that for, um, within this game file, if this event number, which is presumably a loop inside here, has got a scoring method of predetermined international match points or scoring method of predetermined border match, then with the predetermined international match points do this. If there is more than two directions, which means it's an individual event, then store this value in the data. Uh, I'm saying all of that, that would make sense to bridge players, but if you're not a bridge player, you're lost which comes back to my SM comments that you, I needed to find people that at least understood the language of what I said just then to be able to understand the existing code to be able to write the new code. Coding style, have one, A insist, A is always an array, H is always a hash, key value, string, character, integer. I will allow T and J in the code. I had some people who didn't know the difference between a hash and array. Remember I had some people who were over 60s and had never seen a hash or an array. So I added, insisted that for all new code, we added the hash or array. Minus one, plus one. I have long variable names, so this is a cascading thing for all tournaments. Instead of using like the letter T, spell out the name of the model. <coughs> More of the coding style. I insist on the word then. It was only for this project, and the reason being, after the code is delivered, I'm gonna have people working on the code who are from Mississippi, or most likely in Mississippi, and they're looking at the Pascal code where the structure is if something, then something, n. So I wanted to keep it as close as possible. I wouldn't necessarily, I wouldn't have done that other than the fact it was for this customer, this client. Hmm. Arrays, we frequently have no check for an array being nil, so this code by itself would fail if the array was nil. So insisting every time an array was accessed, we'd add the uh, array, make sure it's not nil, then do something. All hash has got to be a key and value. Um, ran into this one a couple of months ago. This was code written a long time ago, it's inside a gem. So they'd slurped in a file, and if the line included the string knockout, or the line included the string round robin, do whatever they were going to do. This is invalid Ruby. And it's because once you do line up include, the bracket is from here to here. Everybody got that? Mm -hmm. okay. So that's why I insist that people try and copy things with brackets. Ruby dash WC is your friend. Um, we went with underscore. We did have an argument early on as to what it was going to be. 
This probably is a little controversial. We did this from, I, I insist on this from the first line of code. All the attributes of a model are prepended with the model name. This is my team model. So my team team number. So it's, it's referenced by a team dot team number, team dot team entry number. And the reason being, and we will look at the old code trying to find out where a name got set or a number got set, you thousands of instances of the string name. This lets us identify with the entirety of the code specific to a specific model. That, that was one of the best things we did. Started out with no gems, and finally, slowly we moved things into the lib directory when we needed to, and then created the gems. We now got about 25 different gems. When we first started creating them, we had, so this is an example of gem, this is the bridge score plus export. We put everything, all the code inside this one file, so we get very large files. We now move to the, the more common, which is to throw everything inside the um, have separate routines. Debugging, when we're trying to debug, it had people adding the def debug into all the different models, people doing lots of different things. No consistency. So I wanted a generic routine which was debug. So we added an ex I did an extension. Everybody familiar with extensions or right. So here's an example, if you do the Rails console, you'll see that this is, I don't upgrade unless I need to. So this is grabbing the first tournament, I get all this flow, and I need. To, I now have a, a, a method which is just debug that tells me what I want, and it's much easier to read. Here's one with bigger font, grab the first board, all this junk, nil, zeros, I only want values that are set so I can figure it and read out what's going on. So I've got a 70 line code that does that, so this goes in the file, it's actually lib AR extension debug, and we add it to the active record, and this is the actual code that does it. So we take the, um, we go through all the attributes, we, if it's something to be ignored, and then this is going to print the strings we're interested in. So by having local routines, we can override it within the model. So here is, uh, you need to make sure we add it to the extensions. And here's an actual code that I've got. This is for a card that is played. We actually work out if the card is played is the best card that the declarer could have played at the time. So we store some encrypted values, no sorry, not encrypted, all within a, a, like a bit mass. So I don't want to print these out. I, I ask it to ignore, but then I print out these local values. And when I do the debug, I've actually got all the values printed out. So this 60, 70 line piece of code in the, um, as an extension has worked very well. Import, export, we have to import all these different types of uh, a bridge, BWS bridge make file, do, which is a file for duplicating boards. Portable bridge notation, lin, which is used for uh, online records. We also take in JSON, XML. And generally we wanted a black box, in, out. Problem with JSON is the structure I had, though it looked simple, I had some models where they were interconnected. So I had a team section which had rounds, rounds had matches, but second, <coughs> they were all interconnected. So when I imported something with JSON, I needed to be able to fix the associations. So I ended up, again, writing an extension, and the extension for JSON imports a few hundred lines of code, but these are the main methods. So what it allowed me to do was to be able to import JSON um, through a cascading method. Something else that was very important is, is watching people debug. So you write code to help debug. So this is partial part of the code. We often found there was a problem here when we created a new model we, we were getting the hash that was coming from JSON, we were creating a new model, and it wasn't working. Now, some of my JSON files can be three quarters of a million lines long. So trying to debug where that was happening. Some common things with debug, we put a unique number so that it's very easy to find. So I have output, this is in the log file. Now if you look at how the debug was set up here, I output the model hash. 
And what I can do now is cut and paste that value, go into the Rails console, paste it, and then run that line of code directly in the, in the console. Uh, actually, what I should have done is added that line as well in the debug output so I can cut and paste twice. So writing debug code to help with the debugging is very important. The debug files, were start, the log files were starting to get big, so for some of the rake tasks, we created a different log file. It, it may, meant we could be running the file, running the program, and also be importing something as a rake task with it, its own separate log file. I showed you the, the gems in development, so that you change a gem, you have to stop Rails, you have to start Rails. In my case, it's 20, 30 seconds waiting for it to restart. So I added in the controller this reload gem, you saw it in the menu, and all it does is load, in this case I know which particular file I want to reload, so I just have it reload the gem, go back to the root path, and I only have to wait a couple of seconds, rather than 20 seconds. <coughs> training mode, you saw what the, how the training mode worked, it's something we added very early on, and that has saved lots of time in giving presentations and in, in training people. The active scaffold, we put in earlier, which is a quick way of being able to create everything before we had the model code, before all the model code, and that's been very useful. We have the concept of um, features. I showed you I had a, a debug version and one in, one in production. The debug version, in addition to running in developer mode had some additional switches turned on. And you saw that I ran in both developer and production at the same time. So even now when I go to tournaments and I now run the biggest events that they have in the, the US where we can have over a thousand people, we have to get everybody seated within two minutes. Um, I will have one port running developer mode just in case anything goes wrong, I'm there to fix it. I'm one running in uh, production mode. The database ID, this has become less useful as we added more and more titles to the code, so that in the title you could hover over it and find the database ID. This is the code we have in the application helper. Uh, we just, just define an ID block and do a yield if the flag is turned on. And within the view, we just have this code, the ID block, you know, that print the table header and then lower down, print the, uh, the ID. So that was, was great. When I deploy this, uh, we have both local versions and we also have a version up in the cloud. So when I deploy a new version, I create a, a master directory and then I create um, symbolic, uh, another directory with almost everything symbolically linked into that directory. So I can now support, in the ACBL they have 25 different districts. So off of one website, sorry, one server, I can define 25 different domains, I can have each one go to a different port, and I can have all 25 of them sharing the same common code. My code base is quite big and I have a, each has their own separate, I call it a local directory, where I have local configuration files. Performance. Early on we worried about performance and looking back we probably spent too much time worrying about it and this is the exact opposite if you ask me at the start what are we saying now. But given time, systems get better and faster the other problem I found is that the, the developers I had didn't have the right school skill set to properly look at performance. Perform figuring performance out is an art and fixing it is an art. A lot of it's database related. If you don't have database skills, you can be just wasting a lot of time on that. So in, in summary, uh, Write code that's easy to support and debug. That was my biggest thing throughout the entire project, was getting that done. Keep routines simple and short. I had some three, 500 line routines in the model, the controller that I was terrible. 
But if it, if it worked, they didn't touch them. It was only when later on, if there was something wrong and needed to fix them, then, then we got rid of them. In my case, I needed to learn the skill set of my programmers, and it varied. So I had somebody who'd never used code control in their life. They were retired, retired programmer, never used code control. So after a while, I gave up. It's like, just email me the files, I'll take care of it. It just wasn't worth trying to teach that particular programmer how, how code control worked and how to use it. For the newer programmers I had, the, I was surprised by the lack of some of the basic tools that are there. I, do, I probably have uh, overrun my time there. I do have some extra slides afterwards, and I do have some other stories on some of those people, but uh, at this point I'll probably have to stop. If there's any questions... I'd love you to go on. First thing I want to hear it. <laughs> So the next bit gets interesting. Uh, projects finished, delivered. This is uh, 2015. Mm -hmm. And does anybody know read the stories about cheating in Bridge? All right, so for the first time ever, there was software. And I could import from all these different <coughs> sites. I could import from the World Bridge Federation. I could import from the European Bridge League. I could import from the ACBL events. I could import from the US Bridge Federation events. I I had the ability of getting all this data in, and then I had the ability to process it all in one place. That never existed. So, <laughs> I took the data of the top, the top 100 pairs, simply because there was a cutoff of like 400 boards. So I statistically looked at the players where I had the most data. So these are the players that, uh, there's a, nearly all into, uh, professional players. So at the top level of bridge, it's like yachting. There is no prize money, but very wealthy people have got so much money that they hire people to play on their team. The sponsors required to play at least half the events in the ACPL, a third of the events in world events. And there's a huge incentive to cheat. The bonuses for some of these players could run as much as 50,000 euros. A lot of these players are from Europe. So it's a 10 day tournament, I get a bonus and the six, five professionals on the team, one sponsor. We're each gonna get 50,000, let's say it's dollars. So the sponsor is willing to spend, and as a bonus, this is not my base pay. He's willing to pay out a quarter of a million dollars just to win a national title or a world title. It, the, the wealth of some of these people, uh, by the way, neither Bill nor Warren hires professionals. They, they're not, as, we're talking of the ones with just nine figures to their, to their names. Um, I'm trying to think of, uh, <coughs> of sponsors that you would um, know. Who was the guy that ran the bank that failed 10 years ago? He was smoking weed at a bridge tournament last year, the mortgage was collapsing. No, it wasn't Dick Fold, it was um, shoot, Jimmy, Jimmy Kane. So uh, Jimmy Kane, is, um, he was the former CEO of the best I really want to know this. But Jimmy's a, a sponsor. He, he's one of these people that will pay these bonuses as high as them. Uh, yeah, Jimmy's bridge story is in uh, 2008, nine when the subprime was going down. He was at a a week-long bridge tournament in Gatlinburg, Tennessee, which is the biggest bridge tournament in the U.S., believe it or not. Um, and he was um, partaking of some herbal medicines, and that's why he was unavailable that week. So for those of you who got a, a math background, um, on the, going up is the number of boards, and then I had a, a calculation I did as to how good somebody was. In this particular one, the, more, the further left you go, the better you are. Statistically, the more data that you have, everything should approximate eventually a straight line. And this is the, the, this, this is the kind of curve you'd expect to see from a, a, what's called a normal distribution. And these are the guys who are the top professionals in the world who play the most. And it's reasonable for me to expect that these guys here are a little bit better. We have some outliers. So in 2015, <coughs> a 
professional player called Boya Brogeland, who the previous year had won the Spin Gold, which is one of the main three tournaments. Um, after the Chicago tournament 2015, he accused of an Israeli player, Fisher Schwartz, of cheating. So I, I was very heavily involved with this. I ended up actually being an expert witness and getting to fly into the Court of Arbitration of Sport for some of these hearings. So for the first time ever, and by the way, the British players haven't seen this. this is, I've kept this data very, very private, so you guys are a little bit lucky here. There's probably only about 10 people that have seen this slide before. I was able to, I, I obviously know who all these dots are. So Fisher Schwartz were the ones that were accused of cheating. And it came out eventually that somebody found out how they were cheating, and how they, one of the ways that they were cheating is when they put the board down and you saw everything was beneath a, a screen, they could push it in any of three different directions. And depending upon where they pushed it and where they left it, they were signaling their partners to what card they wanted left. So that people were watching lots of videos trying to find this. So I can identify those that of being caught. So Fisher Schwartz has been caught, convicted. Pika X Smirnov, who are uh, originally from Russia, but they played professionally in Germany. They represented Germany at the 2014 qualifiers for the, for the World, World Championships in, uh, in 2016. They, they, they just admitted it. <laughs> they said, yep, we cheated, you got us. They got banned for four years. This is a Polish couple, Polish pair, Cesare Belitsky and Adam Zmudzinski. And they were accused of cheating. They were, Poland had won the right to play in the World Championships in 2016, in, I think it was 2015 in uh, Chennai, India. So they flew out there hoping to represent Poland. And the accreditation committee said, we think you've been cheating, so you're not allowed to play. So even though they qualified for Poland, they weren't allowed to play. The Polish team was allowed to play, and you can't write the script. You know who won the World Championship that year. It was Poland. So the question is still, should they have been allowed to play because Belitsky and Medinsky were cheating in the qualifying? They were cheating by scratching. So with the bridge table, if they put the right hand down, the fist down this way, it, it meant uh, clubs. If their fist was this way, it was spades. If it was the left hand, it was hearts or diamonds. And they, if they wanted, that was if they wanted their partner to switch, they would signal the suit they want. They would also go like this. It looked like the guy's got ADHD when you, or OCD when you see him playing because he's always twitching. But he, he would show the number of, you know, the spades, four telling his partner he had four spades. He was also signaling the cards he had. Not sure I can quite remember all the signals, but you know that was a king, this was an ace, um, this was a queen, don't look, this is a jack. <laughs> and so if his hand had, had like four jacks in it. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think this, uh, this was a, uh, a nine, and so he could he could signal his entire distribution, his high, entire hand to his partner. If you watch videos of them now, and know the code, it's very funny watching the videos. But people spent hours looking at it. This is an Italian pair that moved to Monaco for to go play for a guy called Pierre Zimmerman, who who is Swedish but moved to Monaco so that he could always represent a country. So he he paid for five professionals to move full-time to Monaco and they were rated the number one, number two players in the world. Um, technically Monegas but originally from Italy. And can you see a pattern? So this software is able to detect pairs that cheat. This little dot down here is an Italian pair called Burati Lanzarotti otherwise known as the race cars, who were convicted of cheating in the 1980s and never played together since. So I was even able to take data 
going back to the 1980s, process it and figure out who was likely cheating. These uh, H1, H2, H3 is that guy Bob Hammond. He had three different partners. He is not accused of, of cheating at all. But it was interesting to see where his figures were, arguably one of the best players ever. He's, he's right in the middle of the pack. This is his most regular partner and best partner. Um, and then he had one who was getting Alzheimer's at the end. He played with him for a little bit too long. This is the guy called Boyer who accused somebody of cheating. So I, I checked him out, make sure that he wasn't one himself. And he had two partners. As you can see, you know, he's, he's right within this allowable curve. These up here, um, they, all I can say is they play a lot. You know, they're a little bit better, but they are full-time professionals. They're, they're making a good six-figure living playing this game. Yeah, I filed, I, 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 I went ahead and filed the paperwork. They don't, they don't know it yet, but there's a, an investigation going on. You can't be that good. Oh, that lucky. Bridges have got a game of luck. That means that they are uh, they're cheating. So that's what the normal distribution was. I can do the same thing with tournaments, which is very interesting. So I could take the data from tournaments, and this is the data, the 30 tournaments I had the most data on. And same thing, that my cutoff here is 2,000 boards, so this actually goes a lot further down. And it's the similar ratio. But you see it's the, it's called the law of lar large numbers. As we add more data, everything will tend to a middle. And guess what? We got these seven tournaments out there. And so when I identified these tournaments, this was the 2013 Bermuda Bowl, which is the World Championship. And this is where we, some of the known cheaters were. This is the one in Chennai where people were not allowed to play, and everybody, all of a sudden, got incredibly worse throughout the field. <laughs> Unbelievable. Uh, this is now back to 2017, so we're back to the, if you like, the historical averages. This is the 2014 European Bridge Team Championship in Popolica, Croatia, and that's where they first started having lots of video, and so we had video of lots of the people that were cheating. And looking at the video now, it's great. And people never thought anybody would have any interest in looking at videos. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> when I take the data and take out the, cheat, the known cheating pairs, this is the known knowns as opposed to the, uh, you see that the, remember this goes all the way down here. You see how quickly the results tend towards the middle? So um, in this one, I suspect there's about three or four more pairs that were cheating. I have a very good idea of who they are, but the, the etiquette of well, just the rules of bridge is I can't name them publicly, because if I do, I get banned, not them. Um, because of some of the stuff that's been written, some of the people are no longer playing, which has been very interesting. That's the 2009 Bermuda Bowl. So it's very interesting applying this technology in ways that was not originally uh, designed for. All right, I'll stop there. Any questions? You were talking about two balls on your team, and yet for every go to this day, you didn't know Ruby or Yep. How did you assemble this team? I started out with um, with someone full time who was local that I knew, who was not a bridge player. Uh, he's the one that I had to let go after a while. Uh, the it was announced that uh, my company had been awarded the contract for bridge for to, to redo the software, and I would go to bridge tournaments and make it very visible as to who I was and the fact that I was looking to hire people. Um, took some arm twisting because a lot of these people were retired. But it's, uh, for example, I found uh, I found one of the guys that worked on the original XML 
uh, documentation or, or proposals from way back when. So having somebody like him on the team who, who could just give the broad understanding of what XML is. Uh, I, I, fortunately, I, I knew XML. Actually, funny story, I went to a technical presentation before I had the contract, and I had a whole bunch of books, including XML for Dummies, and I've got 13 people in the room. There are uh, 10 technical, and there's a CEO, CFO, and the lawyer. And I said, I'm gonna do everything with XML. I, I, was, I nearly said JSON, but I went with XML. I figured at least they'd know XML. The, the, the technical people in the room were looking at me like, they'd never heard it before. So I said, it's real easy, and I had the XML for Dummies book, <laughs> and I left, I left it there. But I was dealing with people who had never heard of XML, let alone used it. Um, and so having a structured markup was just... One other interesting thing is uh, I used ERD to create the flowcharts of what the, the models look like and the, the structure. I don't, uh, ERD, so um, it's rake space ERD. I assume it's probably a gem to download. It creates a PDF file, which is a, a mapping, of, it's a graphical representation of what your models look like. So I had that and printed it out, and of course I had to, it was across multiple pages because of the way it laid it out. And they were just looking at it going, that'll never work. And I'm like, but this is the model of what you have right now. Because <laughs> I could translate their existing data into something that would create those files. So yeah, the Reiki RD was, was useful. I, I don't use it anymore, it's just, it's, it's too big. Did you have tests for all this stuff? Yes and no. Um, one of the reasons for going to the GEMS model was that it was easier and quicker to test. Most of the testing that we have is high level functional. So I can take an existing, what's called a game file, which is uh, <coughs> events that have been run, scored. So in, in bridge scoring, you, you run the event, you then have to score it, you then have to rank it, rank where players scored, and it's what's called a stratif most events are what's called stratified. So there are three different, typically three different strats running along. It's called the A players, the B players, the C players. Everything's based on this number of master points that you've accumulated over your lifetime. So if your team's got more than 6,000, you're in the A, everybody's in the A strat. If your team's got below 6,000, you're in the B strat. If you've got below 1,000, you're in the C strat. So we have to score it, rank it. Sometimes you have to work out the qualifiers. Uh, the qualifications. Then you have to do what's called ma uh, master pointed, which is work out how many master points each player on each team. And so the master point formula is over 20 pages printed. So what we do is we take a game file, suck it into Bridge Score Plus, the name of the product, rescore it, re-rank it, re-qualify it, re-master point it, and then output in the same file format that it's originally in. And then we could do a binary diff just to see. Actually, we did both binary and also we had tools that would convert that to XML. It was much easier to compare XML. So the tests we were doing were at the very high functional level. And because I had access to 20 years worth of, of game files, I could make sure that you know, we could run there's order of tens of thousands of sample data to know that the software worked at that level. That's, that's a little bit different from does it work uh, clicking, but that was the, the majority of the tests that we did at the very high level. I brought along, so when I go to tournaments, I was gonna, I was gonna plug, plug this in. So this is a, a projector. So when I'm running an event, I, uh, that's a, like a four gig, it's a reasonable Mac. I run it either locally, I've got a version on the cloud, but I want to display on the wall what's happening where people are sitting. So I take a, a projector 
I plug into the back a USB cable, and the USB cable goes into my Raspberry Pi. Raspberry Pi has got a little Wi-Fi card. I carry a portable keyboard, which I unplug so that people can't change it, and I just leave this sitting out. Um, I didn't plug this in because the biggest fear I always have at bridge tournaments is old people falling over cables and sitting there. <laughs> it's not, it does happen. So I didn't plug it in here. Um, but this has been a very neat $35 tool for powering displays. And it's, at one point I even looked at uh, running the software on here. And so this is equivalent to about a 2011 laptop in terms of the specs. Uh, and it runs, it's a little bit slow. Um, So when you go to tournaments, do you run the software? Or is it always you, or do other tournaments run the software? Are they actually like firing up the Rails comp, uh, applications locally and running it? Uh, not locally. So I have a version up in the cloud. There was a tournament a couple of weeks ago. I didn't, didn't go to it at all. I don't even know when they use the software. So I just make it available. and the, I just need to make sure it's current with the member database so that when they're typing in names, we've got the current master points and so can be stratified properly. But uh, that works well, providing I can get these tournament directors uh, to be able to do things like connect to the internet. It may seem silly and obvious to everybody in the room, but that the technical level of the, of the end user, unfortunately, is is, is low. Most of them are uh, 50 plus, not all of them, but say well over half of the tournament directors are over 50 years old. So explaining how to connect to a Wi-Fi network um, is, a, is difficult. Having them run a local copy, they're not at this point and, until there's better support. I'm, I, I don't support that option. Okay. When I go to tournaments, say it, it's just easy for me because I bring, I have a blue case, I bring this, I bring, I bring my Wi-Fi network, and I bring two projectors, and I've got half a dozen Apple Pies. They all fit in half of the box. So. And I look at what the directors have to carry. They've got printers and cables and old-style laptops. The biggest problem they have right now is when they upgrade Windows, it breaks some functionality that was in DOS from years ago. So they are at this point, a little bit stuck. Uh, when you're playing uh, bridge, can you talk at the table? No. Yes and no. Uh, so during the bidding phase, everything, I didn't bring a bidding box, but everything has to be done with a bidding box. You are, if you have an unusual bid, you're required to self-alert. When you play behind screens, you write on a piece of paper, and that's important that if any questions later, then the, the piece of paper shows as evidence, this is not this is what I said, but I did actually write this. All the communication has to be in English. Um, we're starting to see a lot more Chinese players. And so imagine how difficult it would be for us to go play another sport where English is not our first language. So there are some occasional barriers. In the US, when we're not behind screens, there's so much what's called unauthorized information that you're not supposed to officially know. But if you make a bid, you're required to what's called alert it. And then the rules are your partner has to explain what your bid means. I'm mostly concerned about these uh, $10 you make to single kids. You cannot really talk to them. So uh, as soon as the, uh, the hand is over, oh, it's social chit chat, absolutely. So, Just what I can do for $10. <laughs> <laughs> Learn how to play great first. Yeah. Uh, this event he was playing in was two sessions a day for about three hours long. It would be 24 boards. Each board will take about five to seven minutes. So you get the cards out. And etiquette is as soon as you look at the cards, that's it. No more chit chat. You're playing. So you play the cards out, take five, six, seven minutes. The cards go back in. You score it up. And then there can be general chit chat. After six boards, there's a break. Everybody goes to the bathroom because it's all old men and they can get quicker than that. 
And that's the time at which you can socialize and chit chat. If you don't go to the bathroom and somebody says, you just, you know, say, well, where are you from? Actually, Bill Gates at that tournament, he was playing with this guy called Bob Hammer. And I've done some work for Bob's company. He does, he, he does some casino work. And so I've, I've gone around to different places around the world for, for Bob. So I saw Bob was playing. I didn't see who was playing, true story. So I went to Bob. And Bob was playing with some old guy. He plays with a, a bunch of old guys and all these clients. So I was a little bit rude. I go to the table wanted to find out if I didn't know Bob was going to be there, see so if he wanted to do breakfast tomorrow. So I completely ignored the guy he was playing with. He was, it wasn't even polite. just totally ignored it. I was a little bit rude, I'll admit. It was shook almost at game time. Um, and then I, I walked off. And so Bill Gates was the one who was sitting there. And it's probably the first time in his life where nobody, where he was just chicken lip. <laughs> so, so it's like, good morning. I'll tell another Bill Gates story. This was uh, several years ago. Uh, and I was there early. See all these things are on the wall? I, sh I showed you the hang things on the wall. Now, Bill got there early. He must have got, got there about 45 minutes before game time, which is very early. Whatever reason, I was there as well. And I'm walking about 10 feet behind Bill. And there's only one other person in this room. And Bill goes over to him, and they're both looking at looking at the thing on the wall, intently staring at how well everybody did the day before. And Bill taps him on the shoulder and says, um, Hi, do you remember me? We played against each other yesterday. And I'm kind of thinking, okay, you just played a whole day of bridge against Bill Gates, and then he taps you on the shoulder and wants you to know, do you remember me? <laughs> it's like, uh, yeah. So when when Bill comes to these tournaments, everywhere he goes, he's got security. So, uh, in my software, I have I refer to it as the President President Eisenhower Wall, which is when a team is displayed where they're sitting on the wall. Uh, we have all the team numbers and where they're sitting. Is for President Eisenhower when they use the old-fashioned way, they, they would put a piece of paper sticker over it so that you wouldn't see which table he was at. So I have the same thing in software. I call it the Eisenhower. Wall. But Bill Gates is one who it applies to. So if you go to a tournament, you see everything, every, every team has been assigned and there's one blank with nothing up there. That means Bill Gates is, or Warren is in the room. Warren only plays at that tournament. Bill goes to tournaments around the country. And you can no normally also tell you walk into a room and there's one person, at least one person, who just stands out. They're not a bridge player. And they're trying to look as inconspicuous as possible, but it's, it's Bill's security detail. And he has, he has several that go around with him. Well, they've all got these little uh, purses, and you can imagine what's inside those, those purses. My daughter one time got in the lift with him. She was following him, and I was like, <laughs> the doors were closed here. He just pushed her in there. So she can tell the story when she was with, uh, with Bill Gates. You know, if you go to, a, for those of you who went to a, a, the Microsoft things when Bill was still there, you, know, you see him move and everybody goes with him. At <laughs> Bridge Tournaments, he was trying to go up the stairs one time and everybody finished and he was right in line for the food. So he just had to step to one side. He couldn't even try and walk up the stairs. Everybody just got all the way past him straight through. Um, I'm sorry, uh, what were some of the biggest challenges in taking you know, engineers who've never worked with web technologies, never worked with Ruby or Rails? What were some of the biggest challenges you faced in terms of like getting them up to speed on the framework or the language or the platform? So based on their knowledge and their willingness to learn, I would have to give a very specific project. So. Some of the earlier stuff we used FFI and C code, so I'd say to them, all right, I want you to write the C code that does the, the master pointing. So everything's in C. I can give you a user interface there and out. When they started working in Ruby, it was the same thing. It's like, I only want you to work in, in this very constrained area with this set of tools. Because some people just, some people hadn't used an object-oriented language before. So 
the concept of a model with attributes was foreign and difficult. Um, I would normally find within within a month whether whether they were going to work out because I, I'd hire somebody I knew their first month was just it was just a waste of time. Well, they were going to learn, but I needed and I wasn't expecting anything productive from them. I just needed to find out are you going to be productive in months two, three, and four and on. So, if you're a decent programmer, yeah, Ruby should be fairly simple. The adding Rails onto it, if you're not used to a framework, now that's a little hard. But a lot of code is copy-paste. So if you've got some existing code, they can copy-paste edit. <coughs> Finding how people edit, it was, edit files was also fun. So uh, is everybody here Sublime? Or anybody use anything but Sublime? Yeah. Emacs. Emacs, Vim. So those who used uh, those those who used Sublime when they had to SSH into the remote server and have and edit files, lost. No idea what to do with it. Hmm. I, I'm a VI user myself. Yeah. Awesome. Well, um, everyone, give a round of applause.